Welcome. Welcome to Softura's AI in Action Series webinar entitled Enhancing Public Service Through Generative AI. Our mission with these webinars is to provide actionable insights for C-suite executives, government partners, and IT teams. Today, we're drilling down on the burgeoning role of AI in managing both internal and external client support and informational needs. I'm your host, Jim Edwards, an advanced technology account executive here at Softura. Joining me is our esteemed presenter, Frank Braski, Softura's Chief Evangelist for AI, IoT, and RPA. Hi, Frank. Hey, Jim. So uh, I wanted to recognize, uh, I want to emphasize rather that we've uh, designed this webinar around you, the registrants. We solicited questions of topics of interest from you all to tailor today's presentation, each of which could be its own webinar on its own. Uh, we did our best to weave them into the presentation. And by the way, the Q&A section in the chat will remain open throughout the webinar, and I'll be relaying your questions to Frank. So let's set the stage. While AI is not a new concept, we're at a pivotal mo moment where it is ready for prime time. The technology has matured to a point where its implementation across a wide range of use cases is not just viable, but also transformative. Although AI's penetration in most sectors is still minuscule, the opportunities for application are truly massive. So whether you're dipping your toes into the world of AI or are midway through an implementation, today's discussion aims to enrich your understanding and perhaps even refine your approach. So sit back and let's delve into how you can leverage Microsoft Copilot and Generative AI to really enhance public services. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge we've got guests from all over the country, from state and federal and local governments. Uh, we've got directors, we've got users, uh, we have other IT professionals. So we're grateful you're here. So with that, let's begin. Frank, the audience is yours. All right, <clears throat> thank you so much, Jim. Uh, so we'll quickly go into uh, just a little bit about myself and, and really, I just wanna to talk to you about how excited I am about this time in IT and technology, specifically related to artificial intelligence. This is something I've been you know, in the industry for the last 34 years, worked for a couple of big companies, uh, done a lot of work for the military and, and other uh, large uh, federal agencies, as well as uh, local uh, state and, and NGOs. But this time is, is super exciting because the pundits ex predicted that this wouldn't be happening, that we wouldn't be able to have this kind of capability until 2040 or 2050. Um, we're actually now able to do things that I was writing papers about back when I was literally in high school. Uh, so it's super exciting. And, and one of those times I spent in this uh, industry, I spent 10 years at this little company called IDM when we, they were in the midst of developing this deep learning capability called Watson. And you may or may not remember Watson went on to, to beat all of the world's champions in the uh, game show Jeopardy. And since then, we've come across things like Alexa and Cortana and, and OK Google and, and Siri and these you know, so-called smart virtual assistants. But if, if you've used them for any period of time, um, you've experienced something that probably I have, which is you know, they don't seem to learn or get much better over time. They don't seem to um, remember how you pronounce things or things that you know are, are important to you. And all of that can be boiled down to the fact that they lack context and they don't really understand you know, where you're coming from and who you are. They just kind of are answering from a generic perspective. And the capabilities that, that allow this to be different now are this, this notion of natural language processing or NLP, the ability to actually get information out of things that you're typing or potentially even saying. Add to that this, this the, the burgeoning of this new thing called large language models, which is really, um, it's, it's been around for several years now, but it has really hit the, the mainstream media in the last year or so because of this thing called ChatGPT. And when you add that to the ability to do natural language generation, uh, plus let you type into, uh, tap into your own data with a reasoning engine, now you have uh, something of considerable power. And that's really what has changed um, you know, as, as Jim was mentioning, you know, AI is not new. It's actually been around for a long time, but we're seeing this, we're finally at this, um, the hockey stick part of this exponential growth curve. Um, and you think back to where we started from, we started from green screens and literally teletype machines back in the early 60s when, when 
AI became, you know, first digitally a, a possibility. Then we had this kind of dark pages, dark ages in the 70s where not a lot of work was done on it. But then in 95, um, with the launch of Windows 95 and Microsoft Bob and, and uh, Clippy, uh, there were some um, graphical versions of that. And then IBM in 97 actually um, beat Gary Kasparov with, with a deep learning system and reinforcement learning um, uh, they called Deep Blue. That was the last several years that, that transitioned into what is now known as, as Watson. Um, but with the advent of really high powered um, super com computing capable GPUs or graphical processing units, we've now started to get these mainstream uh, uh, smart assistants that we, we've heard about and we've all kind of seen and used and maybe have been annoyed by. Um, but <clears throat> what has happened in the last several years, especially really started about three, now almost four years ago, was this organization called OpenAI, which was a not-for-profit that was founded by Elon Musk and, and, and several others to really put you know, emphasis back on artificial intelligence because people were frustrated with the lack of productivity and, and forward momentum that we've been seeing. And so Microsoft invested in them, several others invested in them. And in uh, early 2000, Microsoft came out with this thing called GitHub Copilot, which has taken the world's largest repository of computer code and started helping enable um, computer software developers develop code um, with 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 great efficiency. And in fact, it's said that now about ninety, or sorry, seventy percent of all uh, code is being auto generated by a variety of different capabilities. And this thing called GPT, this general purpose or general pre trained trainer, uh, is the thing that everybody is is buzzing about. And that's really what kind of caught the world on fire last November when OpenAI combined GPT with a chat capability. And if you've ever used chatbots up until now, most of them have not been exactly you know, stellar. Uh, you know, you, you, sometimes they're actually a person pretending to be a bot. Sometimes they're a bot pretending to be a person. Uh, in any case, I think most of us have experienced a, a, a fail or two uh, trying to deal with chatbots because they just haven't really been uh, what we had kind of hoped they'd been, that the hype had not quite met the expectations. Well, that is now changed. And with the advent of GPT-4 um, earlier this year, uh, and now Google Bard, and MetaLama, and, and Bing, and now Microsoft Copilot, these guys have taken AI and natural generation, uh, and language generation, to a whole new level. And that's what the, the point of this is about. And you say, you might, why, why would you care? Well, I can give you about four trillion reasons why you might care, because it is going to change every sector of the economy, um, both public and private. Uh, regardless of where you are, it will affect you in some way or another. I think of it as a phase change, very much like the phase change going from horses and buggies back in the turn of the last century uh, to cars and automotive transportation. The same kind of phase change is going on right now with um, knowledge workers, creative uh, people, and, and robotics and automation. So what it means for us from a practical perspective is that just in these areas, and this is not my information, this came from PricewaterhouseCoopers. They did an uh, uh, efficacy uh, study about where are some of the biggest areas that they think um, AI-driven automation can help. And if you look across the board, whether it's you know from management reporting to strategy and planning, accounts receivable, et cetera, we've got examples for each of these that we can go through. Um, they pre predict that about 40% of the effort that is spent on these processes today could be automated, potentially uh, is being wasted. Uh, and you know, there's this this you know your your mileage may vary. It may be different for your organization. You may be incredibly efficient, um, but if you're on this webinar, perhaps you 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 have some opportunity for improvement too. So just think about in the back of your mind, what would a 40% reduction in the cost or increase in efficiency mean to your organization? Just think think about that, and and how do you, how do you come up with that number? We'll go through that, and I'll show you that today. So, this is a huge topic, and as Jim mentioned, uh, we could have entire webinars on on each of these various areas. And in fact, we do have webinars on some of these. So, if I don't cover your favorite um, use case today, uh, fear not, we've probably got it covered in one of our other webinars. We we did one on HR and all things related to HR and employee self service. We have one on finance, accounting, and procurement. Uh, related to you know um, order bots and um, making you know simplifying uh, payment processing, matching invoicing uh, with with 
with payments and, and um, bills, et cetera, uh, as well as a, a general um, primer for all that you know generative AI can do and an introduction to the concepts back in the beginning of the summer. And then prior to that, we've been doing a lot of work. This is, it's not like we're, this is new to us. We've been doing this now for several years, um, working with intelligent automation and thinking about the new world of work and how you can integrate you know, these technologies into making your employees more uh, self-sufficient and faster. And if you're wondering, you know, what do people think about AI? Are people scared about it? You know, there's the there's the big, you know, sky is falling. Oh my gosh, you know, here come our AI overlords uh, mentality out there. But really, people are actually excited about the opportunity because they're they're tired and and lack the energy to do their job. Uh, they're they're three and a half times more likely to struggle with complicated things that aren't necessarily in the manual or in the existing um, SOP. Uh, people have have express their interest in being willing to delegate work to, to AI. And uh, a lot of uh, innovators and leaders are saying, you know, there's a lot of innovation um, that we're lacking because people are overworked, busy and stressed, et cetera. Uh, and so AI has a real opportunity to Im improve that. And we, we say, you know, maybe it's not 40% for everybody, but it's probably at least in the 10% range, if not the 10 to 30% range. So, with that, I'll go into a little bit about um, uh, grounding. What is ChatGPT being in Copilot? And so unless you've been living under a rock, um, you've heard about this thing called ChatGPT. And just about everywhere on the internet, uh, in YouTube and various applications, everybody's you know talking about how fantastic ChatGPT is. And I have to admit, I'm, I'm one of them. Uh, I've, I've become a convert and I use it and, and its uh, subsequent tools on a daily basis. Uh, ChatGPT has some, some great capabilities as well as a few limitations. Uh, it remembers what has been said. So remember I talked about the context. So now it can remember previous conversations that we've had. Um, it's also been trained to decline what someone thinks are inappropriate requests. And that's, that's one of the issues there. Uh, and it does have limitations. You know, It's not omniscient and it doesn't know everything. And sometimes it gets it wrong. Um, but it does give you the ability to pro provide follow-up corrections. And in the case of ChatGPT specifically, it doesn't really have knowledge of, of key events or history um, since September of 2021. So just bear that in mind. Now, things that it can do is it can generate text. It can summarize text. It can translate on the fly. Um, it can do text to speech and speech to text. Um, I did a presentation with a group uh, a couple of weeks ago that wanted to do something in, in the language of pigeon. Um, I didn't even know how to spell pigeon correctly, but we converted from English into pigeon. And um, uh, as I was going through the presentation, the, uh, the the customers were their jaws were dropping, going, "Oh my gosh, this is amazing!" Because they they just said it as a, as a joke, um, but it was able to do it. Uh, it can answer questions. It can answer questions that it even hasn't necessarily been told about. So you truly can have a conversation unlike a lot of these what we call FAQ bots that are out there today. Basically, if you don't know how to ask it the right questions, you're not going to get the right answers. Uh, then it can also do things like interpret mixed media and it can look for meaning. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a, in a moment. It can provide context for your business data. You can literally feed it, you know, Excel spreadsheets or, or, or Google Sheets and other, other data that you have about your organization. And it can tell you about them and, and tell you areas of interest that it found that you might want to look into. Uh, it can also figure and reason and pass logical tests. You know, um, from a legal perspective, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very um, functional uh, IRS consultant. It's a fantastic auditor. Uh, it has passed the bar in, in many locations. Um, there are all kinds of rules and regulations that have been fed into it that allow it to do things like understand your codes and regs and your, your zoning uh, and you know what your what the implications are for where you want to place your fence. It can literally figure those things out and use its general knowledge plus your uh, contextual knowledge to have specific answers just for your organization. Uh, and then last but not least, it can do um, you know style and tone. Uh, you can choose it to to tell you to tell it to answer um, at a certain educational level. You can say, okay, tell me um, an answer to this as if I'm a PhD or Tell me the answer to this as if I'm a fourth grader or maybe someone for whom English is not my first language or convert that into Spanish uh, as the case may be. Uh, so what do we mean by interpreting? So I'll just let you let this sink in for a second. 
And so this is its answer. And it's not like it took minutes and minutes or hours to figure this out. All of these answers came back within literally seconds of asking them. And so it has the ability to understand nuance. And the more information you give it, the better able it is to, to answer you. So uh, Sonia Nadella is, is Microsoft CEO. Uh, they've spent about, about $10 billion investing in this technology. And he's really big on, on this notion of using the human language as the new user interface. You know, conversational chatbots are the new apps. And, and don't think of conversational chatbots like the, the old ones you're thinking about, but the new ones that are powered by this kind of capability where they can actually understand what it is that you're asking, as well as provide you information based on that information. So Microsoft has a, a wide variety of capabilities that are available through their Azure cloud services. Uh, and some of the ones we'll, we'll, we'll talk about today, in fact, the demo that I'll show you, uses this concept of cognitive search, which is different than like Google search. It actually goes through and takes what you entered in and tries to get the meaning of what it is that you're asking so that it can you know, figure out that, oh, when you say parking ticket, it could also mean, you know, uh, violation, citation, all the different, you know, different ways people could say that. Uh, you can also think of it um, as, you know, it's it's what you always have kind of hoped and expected Google would do, um, but now it's actually answering in, in a very uh, responsive, intuitive way. Uh, got multiple languages, the ability to recognize forms, and I won't go into all this detail, but it can it can look at images and video. Uh, you can you can analyze speech and do decisions. Um, as well as take advantage of all the, the technologies that I, I just talked to you about. So if you haven't used it, I highly encourage you to go use the new um, Bing chat because Bing has implemented all the capabilities that we were just talking about for free as part of their search service. And you have this ability to come down and you can choose it to, uh, to, to be more precise. In other words, don't tell me things that, that you do not know for a fact are true. Um, or you can be more creative. Uh, come up with some things if, if, if information isn't necessarily known. Uh, let me let me go and look at that. They've also introduced this new capability called Bing Chat for the Enterprise, which does something very different. A lot of organizations have kind of banned the use of ChatGPT for fear of putting their personal data or their organizational data out into the wild uh, and letting people you know access it and, and train the other databases. Microsoft has gone and created an entire infrastructure that allows you to have a protected place where once you're logged in, your personal and company information are protected in this chat. They will not go out into the wild. It will only be used uh, on any highly secure, uh, in the case of the government services, the same background infrastructure that you know the, the State Department, the CIA, the NSA, uh, et cetera, they all use. It, this uses the same backend uh, capability. So, one of the big things that's that's different now is the ability to use your voice. And so literally just to talk to the application and have it figure things out. And you'll notice it also gives you these little footnotes where you can go and find out you know, more about what is, is, is um, the answers are. And it can give you new information that has never existed. You could say, you know, tell me about planning a trip to your, your city or to your state. What are the things I would like to do? Um, are you going to let Google be responsible for, you know, how how you know organizations or potential prospective employers or, or other citizens look at your information, uh, or are you going to be in control of that? So now we'll go into some use cases, and there are, I'll caveat this with there are a lot of them, uh, but you know, kind of the number one one that we see is you know property taxes and payments, being able to handle all the revenue generation capabilities of of a you know of a locale whether that's state, local, county, uh, you name it. Um, utility billing, a lot of organizations, um, like in the one of the counties I used to live in, um, not only were the traditional public services provided via the, the county, also my internet uh, and other services were capable with that. And so they had a very nice um, billing system that uh, people could interface with. Uh, that's a big use case we see, you know, turning services on and off, making payments, making sure everything's uh, copacetic, um, being able to go out and, and understand what kinds of permits or licensing you might need, as well as um, issuing them, um, you know, from pet licenses to marriage licenses, whatnot. Uh, public safety could be an entire, it is its entire own other thing, you know, from police to fire to EMS, 
um, to proactive alerts and notifications to you know citizens for services. Uh, that's a huge area of, of interest. And, and these are, by the way, not in any particular order. Um, they're just as as we have gone through and, and been talking with customers and organizations what their services are. We've got health and human services, um, being able to understand, you know, um, what the what the benefits are, whether or not you know you're eligible for certain types of services, um, et cetera. Uh, one of our HR um, webinars went through the whole onboarding, offboarding, benefits elib eligibility, setting up for insurance, uh, et cetera, um, as well as um, public transportation, schools. Again, that's an entire other domain that can have all kinds of, of um, potential use cases. Um, setting up, you know, interaction with 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 uh, various councils and political meetings, job openings, HR. Again, the HR uh, thing is an entire area that's that's a lot of opportunities exist. Uh, and of course, parks and rec, and then and then there's just it goes on and on from setting up new, you know, uh, voter registration and uh, attracting new businesses to uh, providing for automatic, you know, automated secure public records and um, taking care of complaints and budgeting, etc. It's just so much of it's out there that's that's potential, and that's why I say, you know, literally everything can be improved by this new technology. So some potential benefits. Um, imagine being able to have context across your choice of, choice of channels. And, and what I mean by that is, so oftentimes a, uh, a transaction with one's local uh, uh, public providers requires multiple channels. You might start off with a web search or you might start off with a, you know, a notice that you got in the mail uh, and you go and say, OK, I want to go find out about this. And so you'll go and you'll look for something and then you'll find out some information that will then send you to another channel. Perhaps it's a phone call or maybe it's a place you physically have to go. Uh, you know, God help you if you're a millennial. You, you know, you, you might actually have to get your head out of, the, out of your nose, the, the, the mobile device and, and physically go somewhere and wait in line. And so being able to provide those kinds of services and then remembering that you are actually trying to do that. Uh, will be really key. So, you know, once I get to the DMV, don't make me have to retell my whole story about how I got to where I got in the situation I'm at. Once you know who I am, imagine having, you know, a, a constituent relationship management system that remembers me, what I've been trying to do, when I've paid, when I haven't paid, et cetera, uh, and help proactively do the right thing. Um, collaborative intelligence, the ability of, of of not only making the citizen or the consumer of your services smarter, but also your own folks. Uh, AI, especially generative AI, has been likened to having you know an assistant or a coach that makes every one of your players better, because they don't necessarily have to know everything about everything. Um, they can specialize in their area, but then they can get general help as they need um, throughout the um, you know the, their their daily interactions. Can also be practical to help reduce costs while increasing um, productivity, and it can help you, you know, optimize your workforce. Maybe you don't have to have as many seasonal workers. Maybe you have a high churn in certain areas, and this can help with those high churn areas. You can uh, re replace those areas of, of, you know, friction and, and con contentiousness with better services. Hey Frank, so, there's a, a yes. question that I wanted to. Uh, this would be a good time to put the, this first question out. Okay. Um, this comes uh, from uh, someone out in the west, the west side of the uh, west, uh, the west coast, and this has to do with AI in call centers. So this is an efficiency question, and also how does it work? Question. So uh, the question was: Call centers often face the challenge of high call volumes, coupled with a need for quality service. With that in mind, how can AI technologies like ChatGPT and Copilot revolutionize customer service in these settings? Absolutely, yeah. So, so there are a couple of them are alluded to in this slide, but uh, essentially, think about um, all the things that you do with a traditional call tree today. Being and it's fairly rigid, and, and it can be very frustrating for people who don't have your taxonomy in mind. The way that you organize your organization, they may have a different way of thinking about it. Being able to literally just ask a general question in whatever language they choose, at whatever educational level they choose, being able to understand what that person is asking for and immediately routing to them right to the right person. Um, or potentially even being able to help them and solve their issue or interaction right then with that first call um, without even necessarily having to go to a person. Um, 
those are those are some of the benefits. In fact, I'll talk about it from a, a 911 non-emergency um, call perspective as being one of the potential ways that you could help um, justify the cost for doing these sorts of implementing these sorts of services. Uh, there's there's a lot of opportunity in that space. Does that kind of? But I yeah, but just to, just to clarify, so if someone calls in and they and they have a um, uh, parking violation or something, and also they want to learn about their uh, property tax bill or something in in disparate departments within a city or something in a in a state government is can it can this accomplish what you're talking about can AI accomplish that absolutely um and and I will say that's that's you know caveat asterisk um that depends on the level of integration that's possible based on your organization and and I'll, mm -hmm. actually I have a a demonstration where I, I'll show that uh right. and, and so I'll, what I'll do is I'll skip through some of this other stuff and just real briefly touch base on it um Microsoft has introduced this new product called Microsoft 365 Copilot, which is coming out November 1st. Uh, and, and the big thing is, is that it creates this, it, it adds this capability to all the productivity apps that you're used to using. You know, Word, Outlook, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, Viva, uh, Dynamics, et cetera. And I know not everybody necessarily has those applications, but it, it, it really becomes powerful uh, as, the, as we talk about their, you know, the, impl the implications of that with compliance and security and privacy and, and having, you know, responsible use of this AI. Um, so how that works is, you know, there's the general open models that, that are out there that are, we basically have the ability to tap into all the industry's best AI models and then also build on top of them your own custom models. And I'll show you that in, in a real quick example. And then you add that to this thing called your graph, which is essentially this is the context of you and your data. It's who you are, what memberships you have, what groups you're associated with, what your role is in the organization, uh, et cetera. All those things that kind of make you, you in your organization, plus whatever specific applications you might have, whatever your, you know, your call center apps are, your emergency response apps, your budgeting apps, et cetera. Um, being able to have those in an environment where you can actually type into them uh, and use them. And here's a case where I'll just take us, for example, uh, we would have our own specific model that has, in our case, for, like from an HR perspective, it's got all of our um, HR policies and our benefits. Um, it knows about our, our um, payroll system. It knows about our, our 401k system. It knows about um, our benefits provider, et cetera. Plus, we fed it all these PDFs and these documents and spreadsheets and things. So now a person can go in and ask any question about any of these things, and it can give you an intelligent response. And, and even if it's something that it doesn't have, like let's say the 401k enrollment booklet is just a high level thing and it doesn't talk about the tax implications um, for borrowing against it to purchase a home. Because of the general purpose knowledge out there and, and the, the fact that the IRS publishes all of that information, um, you can go and you can actually ask additional questions and it'll say, you know, I'm not a tax advisor or a lawyer or a financial consultant, but you know, here's basic information. Here's other places you can go learn about that. Uh, and so you could have the ability to say, OK, I only want my people to search just my information or I can allow them to search my information plus the general knowledge information. And I'll, sh I'll show you what that looks like. And in our case, uh, we had our own little HR co-pilot that was tapped into our various um, providers. And that was that was a, a you know, software capability that we built in to make that happen. So this is this is where the magic happens is the integration with these third party systems. So what that what that means. So imagine if you could quantitatively improve, you know, your user satisfaction, um, service delivery and speed and feedback, um, code enforcement and compliance, engagement, awareness and understanding, efficiency uh, and, and staff quality performance and re retention. That sounds like a, you know, a laundry list of really nice things to have. Um, but doing that while well, you could also, you know, reduce stress and user frustration. This is a big thing that a lot of people don't realize is that the, the capabilities now exist to understand the state of mind of the user. They can tell if they're frustrated or stressed or, or you know, confused, um, whether or not, you know, you can help add additional capabilities as well as um, help improve the employees that you have, as well as make it easier for new employees to be more effective. Uh, it's it's a, a huge benefit. And then being able to integrate with your existing providers. You know, maybe, maybe your providers aren't on the screen, um, but maybe some of them are. 
Uh, and if they are, then these are places that we can go and we can tap into and be able to provide the kinds of services that I'm about to show you. So we'll get right into it. So this, this example of a parking ticket. And so, you know, the other day I, I was uh, in a hurry. I was taking my mother-in-law down to the clinic and uh, uh, couldn't go the normal route that I went because we, we had a festival going on. So I ended up having to go um, right around the blocks a couple of times to find a parking spot. And of course, whenever you want to find a parking spot, you know, there's never one available. So I decided I'd, I'd make my own. Uh, after all, I'm doing a good deed for my mother-in-law, right? So um, I go and as I come back, I find out I've got this, this parking violation and uh, a little love note from the meeting raid. And I'm like, okay, uh, you know, one day, Unfortunately, my, uh, my my dog decides to make it so that it's it's very difficult to uh, um, pay that fine because when I go to the websites and I, I Google how do I find my uh, uh, you know how do, how do I pay for a ticket that I don't know the ticket number of, none of the sites can help me uh, and essentially it forces me to make a phone call or show up in presence, and uh, most people start off with it with a Google search and. In this case, my local city, it's a city of about um, 250,000, and there's about 478 sites, no, no exaggeration, that all come to various uh, government services for the city. And uh, one of the things is as you come here, you go say, okay, well, you know, tickets is a great thing. And you click on tickets and it says, okay, enter your citation number. You cannot go any further without your citation number. And so if you, if you don't have it, you're kind of out of luck. And so... Um, imagine if, if this was the answer. You know, if my city knew who I was, welcomed me back, and you know what can I help you with? Well, how do I pay parking tickets if I've lost it? Well, now it's going to think about that, and since it knows who I am, it's it's uh, going to say, "Hey, you know, it's got some empathy for me." By the way, this is not something that had to be programmed in. It, I didn't. No one told it. Right. Oh no, I'm sorry to hear that you've lost your ticket. Even the emojis, it can do that on its own based on the persona that has been given to it. You can tell it to be a stuffy, you know, um, rule following, uh, you know, bureaucrat if you want, or you can tell it to be a folksy, friendly, um, you know, uh, friendly person that that's happy to to chat with you based on your demographics. Um, and so it's you know I know it's frustrating, but I can help you with that. And so. While it was looking for that, it, it proactively looked to find out, because it knows me, if I or my wife had any outstanding um, citations. And it turns out we don't because I was driving my mother-in-law's car. So it says, you know, are you sure that you have your ticket? Were you using someone else's vehicle? Well, yeah. As a matter of fact, I was using my mother-in-law's. That help? Sure. So um, do I know her license plate? And for security purposes, can I share her last name or the street the vehicle's registered? Yes. So it's uh, Pierce. Now it's going to go and look that up. So you know, it just won't randomly show me just anybody's information. Uh, and turns out that uh, if I waited uh, too long, it would actually go up on me. And Here's the actual citation information, what the citation is, uh, who it's registered to, what the fine is, et cetera. Uh, and if, I, if I'm late, uh, there's a re revenue generation opportunity there for 50 bucks. Uh, so I can pay it now, uh, 25 bucks, and it'll go up to 75 if I wait until tomorrow. And I can then um, send this to my phone or send it to email, uh, or I can go ahead and choose to, to pay this right now. And government payments is a huge area of opportunity where a lot of organizations have decided to outsource their payments to um, other third party services. And they have a, um, a variety of charges and, and fees that they pay, which are frankly outrageous. And I know that because this is this is an area of my expertise. I've been in the payments space for a long time and uh, you don't need to be spending what you're spending to process payments electronically. And so here's a case where uh, it, it was able to go ahead and proactively look up the fact that, you know, it knew that I had this, uh, you know, I'm claiming this, this citation, but it also knows that my tuck, my, my uh, new Cybertruck uh, tag is coming due uh, and I'll, I'll owe $20 here in the next month. So I can go ahead and proactively pay for that. You can imagine if you'd had, you know, your, your housing taxes or whatever other uh, taxes or or fees that might be coming up for a particular person, um, you could go ahead and include them in there. Um, you can 
push this to pay with your smartphone. You can interface with these common um, you know, payment types as well as add your own. Um, and because it has this information for me and, and my mailing address uh, and email, uh, I can go ahead and say, you know, email the, the receipt and tag to my address and file. And let me just go ahead and take care of that with, with uh, Google Pay. Oh, that really so quickly Frank, a question for yeah. you on that. So you you mentioned earlier that that there are these exorbitant fees that third party companies would charge. What would be the difference between those fees and the the say the Visa fees or American Express fees? Sure. So so um, in the world of payments, there is an awful lot of of uh, a price compression that has happened uh, in the last I'd say decade or so. Uh, especially with the with the number of these um, payment providers getting in, into the mix uh, and alternatives outside of the traditional Visa, Mastercard, uh, banking, Discover, Amex, etc. So paying you know five to seven percent is 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 no longer you know necessary or rational or reasonable, um, and because there's so many other electronic rails for processing payments, many of the third party providers that are out there. They charge whole dollars, uh, you know, like from a dollar fifty to I've seen as 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 much as seven fifty a payment, and as a percentage of payments, that's insane. That's like that's like clubbing baby seals, you know, uh, check cashing kind of rates. It's 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 horrendous, uh, and so you can provide better customer service to your constituents as well as not pay as much to provide those services. In fact. Many times you can actually get money back from those um, those vendors in terms of what they call the interchange, which is the difference between what they, they charge you and how much money comes through. Um, there's all kinds of opportunities to renegotiate and provide better services, as well as potentially get payments back or, or refunds um, from the money that you're getting and, and taking on these types of examples. And the uh, nice so, thing about that also is this can become part of the ROI for a project. Absolutely. Many times, speed of payments just the payments, and fee reduction. Just the payments uh, savings alone can help pay for those 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 sorts of uh, engagements. And so, just to kind of re recap what we what we saw there was, you know, I was personally greeted because they remembered I'd had had uh, interactions with them before. It also considered me as an entire, you know, as a whole citizen, not just me as a website visitor, but me as Frank Brasky, a, a person that it knows has a home, has vehicles. You know, has children in schools, etc. Um, it understood my request and proactively tried to help. So, you know, when somebody says, "How do I pay a lost parking ticket?" You know that they're trying to pay the ticket. So, go ahead and do the things that you know will need need to be done, mm -hmm. instead of just waiting for them to ask the next question. Um, and then I had the ability to look up something for information that wasn't necessarily mine, but I I had the proper information, so I was able to get that. Um, it was able to look up the information, understand the timing, and it knew that that tomorrow uh, would be too late. So if if I went off today and you know put my 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 check in the mail or my money order in the mail, as it were, um, I would be I would be owed you know I would owe additional fifty dollars because I didn't take care of it right then, um, and it allowed me to to pay the ticket uh, using popular methods and. These are some additional things you could think about that, that could be done. Um, you know, it could s proactively t suggest, you know, hey, we saw that you got uh, uh, nailed with your parking violation here. Did you know that a public parking spot was just over here, you know, a block and a half? Um, or it could have shown me how I could have avoided that trouble altogether just by taking public transportation. Or that I um, could have known that there was a public event happening that morning uh, and suggest me subscribing to the local alerts. Uh, or the potential to advertise or advocate for whatever other services you might have. Uh, lots of cross-sell, upsell opportunities and ability to provide better services for all of your constituents. So, oh, Frank, there's uh, another um, another question that ties back to your HR uh, discussions earlier. Um, and so this question comes to us and it says it's determining eligibility for benefits. And I think what the, the question has to do with an employee of the city, state or, or federal employee, um, and they're determining their eligibility for benefits. So it sounds like during open enrollment, which is uh, coming here very soon for uh, for most all companies. So uh, in public service, accurate and efficient determination of eligibility for various benefits is crucial. Can you discuss the advantages and potential pitfalls of using AI in such a delicate process? Yes, so on, on the one hand, um, depending on legislation and law, um, you could, you could actually make it much more flexible than it is. 
in that the um, the AI agents can go through and have a conversation with you to determine your eligibility, uh, figure out what the, the the pros and cons would be, uh, make it more flexible. Because if uh, depending on where you're at and the jurisdiction you're in, uh, some of those things are literally made the way they are because it's the way it's always been. There's when when things become electronic or digital there's not necessarily the same switching cost or the same transaction costs that are that there used to be when it required two or three people to be in the midst of making those kinds of changes. That's the reason we batched up all of the, the changes at once in open enrollment time anyway, um, mm -hmm. or, you know, the yearly annual thing. Now that's not to say that that's gonna go away, it's probably gonna be around for a long time, but uh, each of those things can be um, complemented with this sort of, um, virtual assistant AI that can answer and help the employee or the person that's signing up consider what the ramifications are and play what if scenarios. Um, so uh, and, and in the HR uh, webinar, I kind of go in through it and talk about some of those those benefits and capabilities. So I, we can send that link out with the with the, the presentation and the uh, the follow up information. Uh, and we could talk more about that once I get past just getting through the how do you justify the ROI. Um, yes. So, um, yeah, so here's an example where we went through and, and did some automation around um, pulling in information from a, a payments processing perspective, and we integrated taking that information, um, analyzing it, and figuring out what it matched to, making sure, you know, sometimes you get payments that have multiple invoices, and sometimes you get multiple invoices for one payment and vice versa. Um, we went and, and kind of automated that intelligently scanned the information that was coming in from our users. And um, if we could completely understand it using the AI, we would go ahead and process it uh, through to the um, enterprise uh, resource planning system or the ERP. And if there was any issues, like we couldn't read something or we weren't sure if we were, you know, less than, uh, uh, you know, less than 70% sure that we knew what was going on, we actually would have an, a human go in and investigate what was the issue and, and correct if anything if there was necessary and, and straight through process that. And we have a, a case study on that. You can go through and, and read about that. You can scan that code. Um, but they had a very short turnaround. Um, they went from having 10 people a year doing this to um, less than one person part-time doing this. Uh, save them over 300,000 a year and, and they were able to pay for back uh, in less than six months. Uh, and another example, this is an area that you might be able to look at. I went and looked up some stats uh, in the, the case of non-emergency 911 calls. And according to these two different organizations, uh, there's an opportunity of, of roughly, you know, 10 to 30 percent of all the calls that get handled by 911 operators um, are, are non-emergency. And there are things that could have been handled some other way. Uh, and and sometimes that could be something that's, you know, triaged on the front end by an AI uh, so that only uh, actual emergencies um, go through to the people that are trained to, to handle those types of emergencies. Uh, this also includes things like mental health issues, et cetera. So uh, depending on your size and how many calls you get, um, there's opportunities to go and look at that. And so I went for my personal um, city's uh, information and said, what are the, some of the types of roles uh, and the, the the categories and the costs associated with them. And I, I found this interesting thing here, this continuous. This is the um, the posting. So there are several postings in my local uh, government that are continuously open. In other words, that, that's an indicator to me that those are high churn jobs. And um, that this is specifically thinking about the emergency communications technicians. These are the people that answer the 911 calls uh, and then do the emergency medical dispatch, et cetera. These are all things that would be targets for potential, um, you know, amplification or, or, you know, ingestion of AI in front of the services to help make those humans even that much more productive. So because that information is uh, available, let's see, I wanted to go through, oh, I, I went, hang on. Uh, did I lose that slide? Ah, yeah, I went through and, and created the, uh, Cost justification. I'll have to send that in, in the follow up. Uh, it was here. Uh, I must have gotten slashed in the editing. But you take those numbers and you kind of multiply them out by the number of folks that you have in those positions, and they become opportunities for either savings or enhancements. And 
with that, uh, we've kind of gone through these different scenarios and now we can go into uh, the next step. So I, I talked about these other webinars that have some of this information uh, branded. There's also opportunities to set up a, a, uh, an appointment time to uh, talk with Jim or myself to go through um, some of these opportunities with you. And um, I encourage you to go out and use the tools. You can use Bing for free. Um, you can uh, sign up for ChatGPT. You can use ChatGPT for free. Uh, however, it's very potentially very slow and you may not have um, uh, success getting in because it's very, very popular. Um, you can go and find out you know, where there might be some quick wins and you can literally ask um, the AIs ways that you can go with your, with your role uh, in your organization, what are things that uh, organizations like yours are using AIs to help you with? Um, then you can also um, use the tools to brainstorm opportunities with your own folks. Uh, you can assess their feasibility and, and cost justifications, as well as look at the the uh, the truth of, of you know what costs are and and what your outcomes might be. And uh, you know, think big, uh, start small, and and create what we call a minimal viable product or test copilot uh, to execute quickly and and learn, uh, improve, and, and rinse and repeat. And uh, as my one of my favorite characters, uh, Mr. Disney said, you know, the best way to get started is to quit talking and start doing. Yep. So, um, so this is a real life example of, of one of the teams we've worked with. Um, after the HR um, presentation, they came back and um, their team, just their one payroll department came back with three pages of ideas of how they thought they could improve um, their department and um, you know, this was a very proactive manager who who kind of couched it as an opportunity for growth, a chance to learn new skills, uh, and for they basically made a competition between the departments and said, "Let's see who can save the most." Uh, and then for those people that are in those jobs, potential opportunity to do more interesting work. Um, so you can scan this code to uh, to book one of us, and uh, we can help you develop the the cost justification and enjoy the benefits. So we've Thank got you. lots of questions, Frank. All right, we've got lots of questions for you. Are you ready for these? Um, I'm, I'm I want to. You're ready. <laughs> um, I wanted to touch. Uh, go back to the determining eligibility for benefits. You talked about a lot of the upside, um, but what are the pitfalls of it? Also, of of someone doing enrollment um, using uh, using an AI uh, tool. What are some of the pitfalls of it? So some of the pitfalls are if you if you don't have integration with your providers, uh, or if your providers are very manually based, uh, a, lo a lot of smaller organizations and some 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 government organizations um, do this themselves. They actually manually handle all of this sort of um, uh, paperwork and, and making phone calls and dealing with the providers, et cetera. So uh, there's some of the pitfalls, not having the ability to integrate with them and do this sort of interactive uh, capability. Um, then others would be the, the case of where you've got uh, legal or essentially ethical issues. Uh, it can it can help um, put guardrails around those, and you can be very explicit. Say, uh, don't get into it. You know, you can literally tell it um, when you're setting up the bot. Do not go into areas that you don't know about or that are speculative. Um, Refer to um, you know um, real people if if there are questions or, or you know refer to a supervisor or a manager, uh, and that's actually the the use case we show uh, in the, the HR demonstration. The gal was was talking about some things that she wanted to do, and uh, it, it immediately said, "Hey, would, would you like to talk to someone about this? Because uh, you know this is an area that I'm I'm not able to to provide you all the answers." Um, does that help? Yeah, yeah, that was an example. Just for context, that was an example where an employee had a an el had an elder care situation, and that was beyond the scope of of uh, of the chatbot. So right. that was that was a very good one. Okay, more here. Um, this is a procurement question, and we have lots of people here who are um, uh, uh, registrants who are in the procurement space. And it, and the question goes on like this: A lot of traditional processes involve human decision making at multiple stages, often known as personal touches. In the context of automating processes like procurement, what's your take on the balance that should be struck between automation and human intervention? So, maybe okay. contrasting current and potential. Sure, sure, yeah. So, um, one of the things is, especially if you're in procurement, is if you can 
uh, and some organizations it's easier than others, some it's impossible. Um, try to figure out what is the cost of your interactions. You know, what does it cost to acquire a pencil? <laughs> or what's it cost to acquire, uh, you know, a, a laptop or whatever it is? Um, not just from the product cost perspective, but your process cost. You know, what is your process cost? And to what extent can you apply, you know, the Pareto principles to get kind of an 80-20, say, okay, these are the things that I'm willing to, to um, allow to happen uh, as long as they're within these parameters. And an example I would use is some organizations consider um, all peripherals related to uh, remote work or, or let's just say knowledge worker work as, uh, as expenses. Um, whereas many organizations will say particular types of devices like computers or, or large systems or whatnot, they may be capitalized. So depending on where your threshold uh, of, of you know, accounting is for whether something is expense or capitalized, you might just say, you know what, all expenses will be auto approved with um, random audits. Uh, and that's something that can be automated. Um, you don't necessarily have to have all of the rules in place. Many times there are checks and balances in place because it was so difficult to do things. But now when you can know who you are, what your current budget is, what you've already spent, you know, what you've already spent uh, and what your, you know, residual allocation is supposed to be. If I know those things, I know your budget center, um, who your boss is. If there's any issue that th this might not be a good um, uh, use of funds, that can be handled immediately before the use of funds ever happens, um, as as an alert and notification that goes to a manager and say, "Hey, do you you know um, approve this uh, expense or not?" Uh, and if so, okay, then it's basically auto adjudicated. Um, and so a lot of organizations are looking at how can they kind of flip the script, if you will, to automate some of the things that used to be difficult to do because you can now have very intelligent rules put in place at the time of you know question um does that make sense that does that does thank you I, frank i got two more if that's okay and okay. Uh, that'll take us up probably to the to the top of the hour so this one has to do with existing systems and um a lot of the uh, registrants attendees have uh recently done uh, implementation. So um, it, it addresses that. So many organizations have legacy systems, or like I said, these recent implementations, like contact management software, um, contract management software, uh, that they're not really ready to fully replace. How can AI yeah. technologies complement or even enhance these existing systems for better efficiency? So why they don't want to reinvent the wheel. How, how, can, they, okay. uh, how can they address it? Sure. Yeah, I, I can imagine if, if you're one of the organizations that's implemented one of these systems, you know how long and how hard and how painful and how expensive that implementation was. Uh, and, and, and no one's suggesting getting rid of these systems because they are the core of, of how you operate your organization. Uh, and so um, we, we fully understand and expect that. And, and that's really what this uh, diagram here was about, um, the ability to actually integrate with those systems. Um, is is really where the power becomes unlocked. So you have your specific uh, applications. You know, the vast majority of these applications that are out there today, as long as they've been built within the last, let's say, 15 uh, years or so, they're going to have these things called APIs or application programming interfaces or web services interfaces or, or some sort of input or output adapters that allow you to talk to them electronically. And and if that is the case, we don't we're not we're not suggesting you get rid of any of those systems. Those systems are still the systems that will run your operations. We're just tying a chatbot into it um, that that has the knowledge of whether or not they have their security property. You know, if they're a member of the right role in the right groups, um, they've got the authorization to do it. Um, it'll basically help them uh, interact and connect with those services. Uh, to use them in a more fulfilling way. And that's really the idea behind the copilot aspect is it's not something, you know, copilot co isn't replacing Word or Outlook or Excel or PowerPoint. It's adding an additional feature on top of all of them. And so we're not going to be replacing your core systems. We're going to be adding an additional capability on top of all of them that allows the 
what I call the mere mortal citizens to come and interface with those systems without having to know anything about them. Because from their perspective, all they care about is, okay. I know that I owe somebody something somewhere and, and, I, and I got money I want to give you. Help me take my, help take my money. Um, does that make sense? That does. And that's a that's a good segue to, um, you know, the, the, the big question for anybody working on, on the budgetary side is how much does this cost? Now, I know it depends asterisk and all these things, but can you give us some some general guidelines on what this yes. would cost, what what whatever this is would cost? Yeah. So so let's just take the very bare minimum of a um, of an intelligent chat bot that could go and read all of your websites. In fact, very much like um, what I was showing here. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Right here. So, so take a bunch of your websites, read in all your information that's publicly available, and then as well as feed it in information that you have um, already for your training materials and other, other policies, et cetera. Um, feed those all into it, and then be able to have an interactive, real conversation with correct results and correct responses um, to do something like that can be done you know it it doesn't have to be a multi-month project it, you know i i know my, my boss is probably sweating as i say you know it could be something that could be done in as little as two weeks but there are so many gotchas and caveats associated with that um but you know that level of interactivity and using generative ai to provide a much better bot capability doesn't have to be this expensive capital outlay. Um, now, starting to inter integrate and interact with things like your you know, systems of record and your sources of truth for payments and fines and, and you know, taxes and, and your GIS system, et cetera, those things all will have a cost associated with integrating with them, depending on what it is that you want to do. Uh, in each one of those, you can think of as, as being Kind of a little mini project that might be from a matter of depending on how sophisticated your organization is from a couple of weeks to several months um so we're we're talking something that is most likely going to be a fraction of what you paid for your core systems um is that, is that helpful yeah and so the outward facing uh using using currently outward facing information would be a really easy place to start and a fairly yes. inexpensive place to start. And that could yes. be launched in a matter of, of a very few months. It's when we connect with the back end systems that we that the costs uh, start to roll up because it just involves a lot of time and a lot of programming and, and all that, right? Would that be fair? C correct, correct. And because of this new world of work, um, it's not like it used to be. We're not talking about buying a bunch of servers. We're not talking about buying a bunch of hardware and, and software, right. et cetera. We're only paying for what we use in these external services. Now we we would pay a consultancy like ourselves to help you make this happen, um, uh, but but there's nothing that would prevent you from doing this yourselves per se, um, or or engaging with someone like Softura to to we do this for a living. Yes. Okay. Well, Frank, thank you very much. Uh, your insight was was very much appreciated, and uh, we'd like to close out the webinar now. Uh, we wanted to keep in our commitment to respect your time, and we stayed within our 60-minute time frame, but the conversation does not stop here. So everyone who's attended the reg or registered for this will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording of this webinar. You can revisit the insights shared with you today at your convenience, and please do share it with your colleagues who couldn't join us. We understand that this topic can raise specific questions for your organization, which is why we have offered to hold 45 minute consultations with Frank. In our follow-up email, which you'll receive shortly, you will find a link to arrange for this consultation. It's a wonderful opportunity to address your unique challenges and needs in a one-on-one -on -one setting, and also an opportunity to get to know Softura and learn about Softura's early access to these technologies. So on behalf of Softura, We'd like to extend our heartfelt thanks to each and every one of you for attending this webinar. Your engagement and participation are what makes these events worthwhile. Wishing you a great afternoon. Thank you, Frank. Thanks everybody for attending. Thanks, Jim. All right, take care. All right. Bye everybody.